Welcome to The Creators here at Sun City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by creators. Art, making what you make. Today on The Creators, author Ernest Hebert talks about his series of books from the fictional towns around Darby. The first of which is the acclaimed novel, The Dogs of March. So subscribe to our channel, comment, and most importantly, watch Building With Us as we build community with you. So welcome back to Some City uh, and the show that we call The Creators. And we are here in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire, uh, to 67 High Street. And uh, today, uh, our creator is a, a writer, an artist, uh, who uh, I have actually known for quite some time, although there was a big space in between there where I uh, didn't really uh, uh, have the pleasure of, con of conversation too much. Um, but uh, Ernest Hebert is here with us today. and Welcome, Ernie. Hey, it's great to be here. I, uh, I know this area a little bit because my wife's from Dover. Okay, good, good. Um, and actually, just before we get uh, into some questions and, and prompts, I just want to mention that uh, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Ernest Hebert uh, probably sometime in the early 80s, probably would have been uh, maybe early 1982, um, because I had read his first published novel uh, called The Dogs of March, great novel, and um, then saw that he was teaching a creative writing class at Keene State College and immediately signed up for it and uh, uh, have always really appreciated uh, the, uh, the inspiration uh, that I got from that book and from getting to know you and talk, uh, talk with you a little bit back then. I, I, think, I think that uh, class was the first creative writing class I ever taught and I'm surprised you, you survived it. <laughs> <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed it, and actually, I mean, maybe before we get into your uh, uh, lengthy publishing career, uh, since we're we're on the topic of teaching anyway, a number of our guests on this show uh, have been artists of different types who also have, at one point or another, been teachers as well. Um, after that initial foray foray into teaching at Keene State College. You had a, a fairly lengthy career of, uh, or, or sort of parallel career of teaching uh, as well, right? Yeah, I, I, I taught at Dartmouth College for 26 years. I, I'm the uh, uh, first person to be tenured specifically as a fiction writer at Dartmouth. Uh, and uh, I retired as a full professor, which is um, a little bit shocking since uh, I, I don't even have a master's degree. I have a, I, all I have is a BA. So somehow I sneaked into, under the radar well, congratulations on that. That's Thanks. <laughs> I, I have to say that uh, I, I, I love teaching, and I, I, I have I still I, I still stay connected to some of my students. Uh, I have a lot of some of the women's students. I call them my honorary honorary daughters. Uh, so it's it's been a great pleasure. And a lot of my students have gone on to publish uh, books. Tara Darman uh, comes to mind. She publishes middle middle grade. Books. Uh, probably my most successful student would be David Benioff, who's the uh, uh, main writer for Game of Thrones. Wow, I, I had no idea. Well, congratulations on that. And uh, uh, I know that feeling too from having had a few students at, at UNH that I, I really felt, uh, you know, I haven't been teaching that long, but I do feel as though there's been some who uh, are, I'm likely to hear about uh, in the future uh, related to filmmaking. Um, so let's let's get into uh, some of your writing, and how about uh, if we talk first about, as I mentioned, uh, The Dogs of March was your first published novel. If I recall correctly, you had written a couple of novels before that and, and didn't get them published. I'm I, talk about the early days. I wrote, I wrote a, uh, a sci-fi uh, book um, and uh, I also wrote a uh, uh, problems with, uh, on campus back in the, you know, dealing with the, uh, the crazy uh, 60s and uh, crazy 1960s. 
but th they were, I guess you'd call them apprentice works. I was just learning my craft. Um, when, when I wrote Dogs of March, I, I, um, I made a big uh, change in, in the way I wrote. Uh, I, I realized that, uh, that I'd been writing too fast because I was working for a local newspaper where you have to write fast. And I realized that most of the stuff I, I, I'd written that was, that was good was written over time. Uh, so what I did was I had a, I had a, um, uh, a typewriter, um, a, a manual uh, typewriter. Um, God, I'm, I'm blanking on, on the name of my typewriter now. Uh, but, I, but anyway, I, what I did was I, I, um, uh, I would, I would, I would write, write a, a scene in longhand, uh, and then I would uh, type a page, take the page out of the typewriter, and I would uh, pencil edit it. Uh, and then I would put the page aside and I would retype the page. And the, I had uh, two rules. One rule was that it had to be perfect page. Uh, and the second rule was I had to have, had, the page had to have something on it that I hadn't seen before in anybody else's writing. So those are the two rules I made for myself. And uh, so Dogs and Marsh ended up being a, a one draft book. Uh, but it took me four years to do it. I worked two hours a day, six days a week. And my typewriter was a standard uh, Underwood uh, typewriter, which um, uh, I inherited uh, from my uncle, the Catholic priest, the man I'm named after. His name was uh, Joseph Ernest Vacarist, and uh, my full name is Joseph Ernest Vacarist Hebert. Uh -huh. And then, so after all that hard work over a span of four years, then Dogs of March uh, comes out. And before we talk about the, the response to that, I want to see how my recall is. Um, as, at least what's in my mind is that the first line of the Dogs of March was teeth, right. straight teeth. Teeth. Teeth, straight teeth is the first line. And it, it really comes from a family that uh, lived above my family uh, on 19 Oak Street in Keene, New Hampshire, where I grew up. Uh, it was, they, were, they were incredibly poor, uh, and uh, they all had bad teeth. And, and it, somewhere along the line, it struck me that uh, uh, t teeth are really, really important if you want to be a success in life, especially when you're young. By the time you get to be my age, you, you're so ugly that nobody even looks at you. So it doesn't make much difference. But when you're a young person, uh, you know, you, you, your smile means something, and the, and the condition of your teeth uh, kind of signals your, your social class, signals who your parents are, signals your own uh, sense of yourself. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, I was writing a story about social class, so I, I wanted to start off with that uh, issue of teeth. So um, who is? Who is Howard Elman? How, Howard, Howard Elman uh, comes from an incident that occurred w when I was uh, managed a small gas station called Top Gas uh, in Keene. I wore a little blue jumpsuit that said Top Gas right here. I can remember sometime uh, after I published a work, a guy stopped me on the street and uh, he said, I, I know you. Uh, what do I know you from? So I named my first book Dogs of March. He said, no, that's not it. So I named my second book, a little more than Kate said, no, no. He said, Top Gas, you, you used to wash our window. They don't do that anymore. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, uh, one day, this guy came into the gas station and he had w one arm, but he was, but he was a big, big uh, working man. He had a kind of a dull, intimidating glower, kind of look at you like. Uh, and uh, that vaguely registered with me. Uh, and uh, even though he had only one arm, he, uh, he was very competent in uh, pumping his own gas. Um, uh, and he was uh, not pumping his own gas, but in checking his oil while I pumped the gas. In those days, you, uh, you couldn't pump your own gas. Uh, and, uh, and he got in the car, and I, I, then I noticed while I was washing the window that uh, there was a small boy with him. And he, and he looked at the boy, and the boy looked at him, and there was something in his face that just lit up. And all of a sudden, that dull, intimidating guy became uh, a, a love that he had for that boy. You could, you could see it. Uh, and, um, uh, and a certain vulnerability. So, and it registered in, in my mind as this, this was a man who was tough and tender. 
it, it was just a passing thought. And I actually forgot it for a, a certain amount of time. It could have been a few weeks, a few months, I don't remember, but I, I forgot it. And then it came back to me. Uh, and I, I, I just it came back to me. Then it came back to me again. And it kept coming back to me. And I suddenly thought, well, who is this guy? Why haven't I seen him before? You know, he's got one arm. You'd think that I would, that a one-armed guy in a pickup truck, probably local, you would see him. But I never saw him again. I, and I sometimes think it may have been a, a hallucination or something. But anyway, I, I had to write about him. And so I wrote in longhand uh, a day in his life. No, no plot. I just wanted to get to know this character. Uh, and, and that became a uh, kind of a, a way that I write things. I, I don't begin with a story. I begin with a character. And I, uh, and I always uh, uh, write a day in his or her life. Uh, uh, and in, the, in that day, I try to write everything, uh, everything you can think of about the person, even irrelevant things, uh, because I'm building up a database of information uh, about the character. Uh, and uh, so uh, eventually, I, I spent a huge amount of time doing this. Uh, this is before I, I mentioned about the time about you, the typewriter stuff, just getting to know this character. Um, and um, uh, I, I must have worked on that maybe uh, not a year, but close to a year. Uh, and I had a huge amount of information about the character. And I was beginning to see uh, some, uh, uh, some themes, some plot ideas, but I, I didn't have a plot. And uh, I decided if I was going to write a novel, I'd have to have a, a plot. And so it occurred to me that I, I did most of my scheming um, and a, a plotting. Is, what is plotting but scheming? Most of my scheming in the car driving alone. So one day I told my wife, I said, uh, I'm going to take a road trip uh, to plot this book. And she actually let me get away with it. Uh, and so I got in the car and I, I drove uh, all day uh, and ended up in um, Delaware in a campground. And I pulled out and I, uh, and I oh, I, 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 mentioned, I sh should mention that I, I brought along one of those old style tape recorders, which are actually better for driving than, uh, than, I, than the iPhone I carry now because they, they had great big knobs, uh, buttons on it, which I didn't have to, I didn't have to look at them. I, I could feel them. Uh, whereas the iPhone, you have to screw around with it or stick it on a stand. Or, yeah. and it, plus, it's illegal Not now, right? To do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so anyway, when, uh, anyway, so I had I, I say he does this, he does that, you know. And typed up my notes, and uh, by the time I got to New Mexico, uh, I had a plot. I turned around and came home, uh, and that's when I, I started writing the book. But it all began uh, with Howard Elmer's character trying to invent this guy with the, uh, uh, with the uh, 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 one arm. And by the way, uh, when I started writing the, the book, or started, I can't remember when I started writing it, I was just thinking about it, but anyway, uh, I wrote about, a guy, about, the, about this guy who loses his arm uh, in an in a accident in a textile mill, uh, which was quite possible. The mills were very dangerous in those days. I know I, know I worked in them. Um, but, uh, but then I realized, now I'm writing a, a story about a guy who has a, um, uh, you know, a physical problem, and that's the story. I didn't want to do that, so I went back and rewrote the the, the chapter and just cut off his little finger, and now I had a, a, a symbol. This is the guy about a guy who loses things. So what, one of my one of the things I try to do is I don't try to decide what symbols are. I, I just write, and then I recognize that they're symbols. Uh, or I recognize that there's a theme. And, and I think that's the reason that most writers are, 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 are quite well read. Because if you, if you read a lot, you, you begin to internalize all that stuff. And if you're not well read, you, you don't know enough uh, from reading uh, other people's work just what is important and interesting in your own work. That's why you need a background for reading. Well, it's. That's kind of a nice segue into, you know, one of the themes of, of the show, obviously, since we call it the creators, is that whole uh, creation process, whether it's applied, you know, to uh, 
uh, paintings or drawings, which you've brought some of your own uh, drawings as well today, uh, or creating characters and developing characters and then developing the story uh, around them. Um, and that's something that you've been doing for many years now. Can you, can you kind of put your finger on you know, what it is that has kept you, uh, you know, wanting to do that kind of work? What is it that inspires you? What is it that drives you to, uh, to continue to create? Um, well, yeah, I, I, it's, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's the, it's a, I can have a passion for, um, I guess for fantasy. I, I'm, I'm a, uh, I live, um, I, I live a very conservative life. I don't mean politically conservative. I have, uh, 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 I'm a very practical-minded uh, uh, French-Canadian Yankee, uh, and very, very live my life very conservatively. But in my head, I'm a crazy man, uh, and I have a, I've always had an incredibly uh, complex uh, fantasy life, even as a small boy, uh, and uh, and I I always I, I see the, the the difference between the real life and the fantasy life the fantasy life is uh, you know allows you to uh, allows you to uh, not not get bogged down in the, in your own dreary existence uh, uh, i've i've never been bored I, I, boredom is not part of my makeup because i can always uh, jump into my head and somewhere along the line i decided well maybe i can actually make a living out of this <laughs> so uh, uh uh, I, I'm basically I'm just following uh, my own madness. That's I, 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 I will say that, uh, that I think one of the uh, interesting things about uh, about teaching writing I learned is that every writer has to kind of invent how he or she does things. It it, it uh, you can't follow Hebert's way. You have to follow your own way. And uh, I, I always try to teach so that people could experiment and, and find what works for them. Um, and that's, that's the challenge and the fun of teaching. It's, it's never the same. Every class is different. Every person is different. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I can definitely uh, relate to and agree with that, that method very much so. You know, those sort of... Uh, uh, boilerplate ideas on how you're supposed to do something, especially when it comes to creating something. You know, uh, I have always uh, been averse to those sort of boilerplate ideas. Uh, so I want to go back now to the early works. Uh, you also created a town called Darby and then proceeded to write a, basically a seven volume series around. Uh, that uh, that area uh, that you created, there's a, a New England town, right? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, my, uh, my first agent was Mavis McIntosh, who I didn't know at the time was, was a really big deal in New York publishing. Uh, and she told me, she said, I, she was an old lady when she met me. She said, young man, she said, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of advice. She said, whatever you do, don't write a series. They'll only read the first one. Well, she was right about that. So I, I, read, I read seven books and basically... Uh, even though uh, two of the other books beside Dogs of March have been won, won uh, pr prizes of one kind or another, uh, that's the only one uh, that, that, that sold. Um, what was the question again? Uh, just uh, tell us a little bit about that, that series that you were advised, oh, yeah, against, yeah. Uh, advised against writing, uh, but uh, then did. Uh, 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 Darby is a combination of three towns in the Monadnock region of New Hampshire. Uh, West Milan, where I live today, uh, and where, where my wife and I uh, had our first real place. Um, and most of the geography of, uh, of Derby is the geography of West Milan, which is a town that I, I love the first minute I walked into it and which I decided had to be home. Um, and the, um, the other two towns involved are the town of Sullivan, New Hampshire, and the town of Dublin, New Hampshire. Sullivan um, uh, had used to have not, doesn't doesn't exist anymore. Uh, uh, an area called the, that they called the Patch, uh, and it was um, um, a, a lot of 
uh, you know, falling down cabins and a lot of poor people, uh, all who seem to be related in some way. Uh, and uh, 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 West Milan is a kind of a middling town. There's not a lot of rich people there, not a lot of poor people. It's kind of in the, in the middle. And so I, I wanted to put my poor people in a particular, in, in Derby, and I kind of based it on this area in Sullivan that I was familiar with uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, the, other the other part, the other town is Dublin, New Hampshire. Uh, D Dublin, uh, you know, is, uh, has, has uh, Dublin Lake and Mount Monadnock, and uh, there's a lot of rich people there. Uh, and uh, there was a particular place that, uh, that was called Pompelli Hill Mansion, where my mother worked as what we would call today a nanny, though, though I think she would have been appalled at that phrase. She, she took care of two children uh, for the Cabot family in this huge mansion. She was a, a nurse, ne needed a job, and, uh, um, and, and she used to tell me all these wonderful stories about the, the mansion and how, uh, how uh, there was a guy there, his only job was to polish things. All he did was polish things. They were upstairs maids and downstairs maids and cooks and just about everything. And uh, I was f f fascinated with that. Uh, and I knew a lot of the, I didn't know the rich people, but I, I, I knew their children uh, because they were my generation. And I, I really admired, the, I admired the, uh, these, these people and I, I admired the whole idea of old rich. Uh, it was then I met some new rich people who seemed to me um, not who seemed to me kind of, kind of crazy and and uh, self-aggrandizing kind of people. Uh, so I I took that element of uh, in of Dublin and transferred it into Derby and called it Upper Derby. And you know the the way you describe I mean I'm I'm. Fairly familiar with uh, uh, with those three towns, uh, at least up to a certain point. I mean, uh, from about 1970 when my family moved to Spofford, New Hampshire, oh, which yeah. is in the southwest corner sure. of, uh, of uh, New Hampshire, um, up until uh, I guess the early 80s. Not long after I had the class with you at, uh, at Keene State, uh, which is when I left the area. You know, I, I can remember those different sort of social classes that were very apparent in each of those towns and, and other towns around that area. Um, and of course, that that makes sense in terms of kind of providing a, a, a platform and putting them together as the town of Derby because you've got that sort of uh, gentrification and working class and rural poor who are relatively poor. hidden. Uh, and farmer class. Yeah. They're, they're a whole different uh, thing. What, the, the, what really surprised me and amazed me about farmers, especially when I was a reporter for the local paper, I had to go to town meetings, you know, was just how smart uh, farmers have to be. They have, they have to be uh, Renaissance people. They have to know, uh, you know, the, the actual physical stuff that they do. Uh, they have to have a sense of business. Uh, they have to have a sense of commodities. Uh, th things, and they have to be philosophers too because of the, of the you know, way the weather affects them and everything. Uh, and, and they tend to be the, the wheeler dealers in town. They run the, they become the select people in the town. And uh, so I was uh, uh, I I impressed by the farmer class. And I have to say that my wife's sister uh, is a farmer and she and her husband do are dairy farmers in, in uh, Newport, uh, Vermont. Uh, and uh, and they have that uh, kind of re Renaissance part of their of their personalities. So um, before we fully shift uh, to the more uh, uh, up to date writing that you've done, uh, and actually I guess as a way of doing that, um, I had asked if you might do a little bit of a, re of re a reading for us uh, here today. Um, your latest published work is called The Contrarian Voice and Other Poems. And uh, I'm wondering if uh, you would do us the honor of doing a little bit of a reading from that now, and then we'll talk about some of your more, more recent work. I, I'd, I'd love to. Um, the, 
this is a book that uh, uh, really came out of uh, out of nowhere for me. I, I had had no idea I was going to write a book of poems, uh, but I st I started. Uh, I, I got on a Facebook, and I, I really loved Facebook. I love what, hearing what people say and seeing the pictures of their cats and, and the kids and all that stuff. Uh, and, but I decided that I wanted to, I was going to use Facebook to publish little mini, mini, mini essays because I get a lot of uh, crazy ideas, and they, they die in the vine. So I started putting them on Facebook, and some of those uh, morphed into uh, into something close to poems. I'll read one. I think this is one of the first ones uh, which I'll read. It's called uh, A Tad, and it's a really ad advice to writers. Uh, for some people, uh, a writing exercise is a seed that they can plant and grow creative work out of. Me, I never w worked from an exercise in my life. Writers were all different in the way we go about dreaming up our pieces and setting down the words. What we have in common is that we perceive ourselves as outsiders. Most of us work alone, and most of us are at the core uncomfortable in our relations with our fellow human beings. We watch them, but we are never quite among them. It's easy for writers to become isolated because isolation is inherent in our nature. For that reason, we need to come together once in a while. We need to remind ourselves that writers, for better or for worse, shape the world. From the Declaration of Independence to Mein Kampf, from ads in magazines to suicide notes. Remember that God didn't write his own stuff in the Bible and the Koran and all those other good books. The prophets were his ghost writers. All writing is important, even the stuff you never show anyone, because every line helps you understand yourself a tad better. A tad? What is a tad? Is a tad more or less than an iota? Bigger or smaller than a smidgen? It's only writers who ask themselves such seemingly unimportant questions. Uh, I, I, I'd like to read uh, the poem. This is the one thing that sparked this book was that I wrote a poem about my mother, and it's the the piece of writing that means the most to me personally. It may not touch somebody else, but when I finished writing this poem, and it took me a long time, I wrote, I wrote a lot of different drafts, um, I, I thought, you know, if there is a God, he put me on earth to write this poem. And this is the piece of writing that means more to me than anything else I've ever done. And it's also one of the few pieces that is uh, almost totally autobiographical. Most of my stuff is, you know, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of me, a little bit of people I know, a little bit of who knows where it comes from, a little bit of what I read. But this right here is, uh, happened almost the way uh, I'm re gonna read it. It's called My Mother's Donuts. On your deathbed, you told me the stems of the flowers I picked for you when I was a boy were too short to put in a vase. I didn't have the heart to tell you, you said. I remember the smell of the sun on my clothes that you hung on the line on a hot summer day. And in the winter, the smell of the air from the clothes steaming off the radiators. You remembered how happy you were with a new electric dryer. I remembered you made donuts, the aroma, the heavenly taste when the donut is still hot from the boiling oil. By the time they cooled, the taste was ordinary. In those days, people didn't tie their dogs, you said. Yes, they came from miles around, drawn by the smell of your donuts. You always made the mistake of throwing them the holes. I couldn't help myself. I laughed. You were too weak to laugh. And in the spring, when Dad burned the dead grasses, do you remember that smell? And the color of the new grass growing through the black burn scar after the rain, the brightest green of the new season? There's no waiting for an answer. You've shut your eyes. I go back in time, see myself picking flowers, a boy's pure love for his mother, so brief. Um, the, the, uh, I, I like to, I, I, one, another thing that, that turned me on to write poems, but I, I actually started writing 
a, a novel that I just could not get, could not make work. But there was there were some ideas and some lines in it that I thought were pretty good, and so I went back and and fooled with them and uh, ended up writing uh, some poems. Uh, I'll read one of those now, but I like, I like to show you a picture. This is a, a drawing uh, that I that I, I did. Can you can you see that? I can. Um, I, I like to draw. Uh, I'm not very good at it. Uh, I'm kind, I'm, I think I'm a sort of a natural writer in that uh, words just come to me. But the drawing, I have to I have to think and and uh, actually work. Writing is not that hard for me, but drawing is really hard. Um, this is the first poem, uh, and uh, it's it's odd that um, a, a poem. This poem was partly inspired, actually, by a novel I wrote uh, called uh, Spoonwood. Uh, uh, it was an image in there of a boy uh, dying in a snowbank, uh, or maybe not dying. We don't know at the, until the books until the end of the book. Uh, and that image, which I got from uh, Winter, where I saw a hump. Of the snow with a hump on it, and and I imagined that there was somebody there. Uh, so anyway, this is for, this is this is um, the follow-up to that. It's called hypothermia. I saw what I thought was that old self, a snow mogul throbbing with a heartbeat, human being as a sculpture, but that was not the old me after all. It was you, not dead, but like when pretending to be dead. Body temperature dangerously low, mind not exactly unconscious in a torpor. I strip you to your underwear. You are slender with small breasts, a boyish ass and a curved feminine belly. I undressed, leaving on only my shorts, crawl into the sleeping bag with you, and looked at the Big Dipper through hardwoods bare of leaves. Slowly you began to warm up. Come to consciousness, I said. Do I know you, you said? I hardly know myself. We lay quiet and still for an hour. Then I asked why you came to these woods. You said, listen. I don't hear anything. Yes, you do. Listen. I hear it now. The tick and scrape of tree branches. It's nice when the wind blows through the tops of the trees and underneath, it's still. You came for that, a sound? Yes, the god roar, to record it for posterity. I heard him in that sharp, cold wind and lay down to die in the snow. He was kind to me. I heard him whisper, don't be afraid. I heard him when he brushed the snow off me. That wasn't God, that was me, no. It was God, you were doing his bidding. You were listening to God and forgot you were cold. Maybe not. Maybe he planned it, knowing you would save me and bring us together, understand? How can I, when my first thought was, you were a snow mogul, you're thinking of me as a problem, when actually I'm a solution. Um, so that's the beginning of this so-called novel I wanted to write about a kind of a doomed love story. Uh, and the, um, the, 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 the female protagonist um, is a, uh, 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 she, she does the, uh, the sound in, a, uh, uh, in, in video and she records all these sounds. Well, she was out there to, 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 to take, to, uh, uh, to hear what the, what the night sounds uh, are on that particular that particular light, and that's where the, uh, the image of the god roar uh, comes from. Um, I think I'm going to read one more, and then that'll be it. There's, there's several poems here. I'm not quite sure which one to read here. I think I'll read the short one. Uh, we supped on homemade bread 
and lentil soup, flavored with garlic, onion, carrot, and potato, eaten with wooden spoons I'd carved from white birch. You said, I like these spoons, no clinking sounds. I never thought about the sounds before. If you listen, you can entertain yourself with just about any sound. So everything is music? Everything waits to be made into music. That's where you come in with your recorder. I hope so, yes. The soup is delicious, thank you. You push the wooden bowl, bowl, wooden bowl aside. Do you serve meat, you asked? Not since the middle of the summer when I found the deer herd, my family. I'm glad you don't eat meat. Do you eat meat, I asked? When I have to, I've always wanted to eat lion. Not the flesh, the roar. God is in that roar, begging for me to eat him and relieve his despair. Uh, so I think that's the kind of stuff that works better as, as poetry and, and not, as a, uh, uh, not as fiction. Um, I, I really liked write, writing, writing these poems and uh, I hope to write some more someday if I get visited by the muse. It's great stuff. Um, thank you for, for giving us that reading. And uh, you mentioned and showed a, a drawing that's in the book and you also brought a few uh, examples of your uh, uh, artwork with you. Uh, would you mind showing us those and telling us a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, th th this is the, uh, uh, my map of the, my imaginary town of Darby. Uh, Darby's motto is uh, uh, Town Meeting Spirit 1753 to Doomsday. I always wanted to put that in a, on a sign somewhere. And so there's, you know, there's diff different Darby's. Darby Depot is where the poor people live. This is, uh, I call it uh, A Bear's Folly Mountain. There's a big mountain. It's, it's a little bit of a kind of a cross between Mount Monadnock and Mount Escutney. Uh, in the in the books, A Bear's Folly is trying to uh, is trying to uh, uh, farm uh, above the two two thousand foot mark. Uh, but uh, in my mind, A Bear's Folly is in me uh, writing seven books about one town uh, because. Um, uh, of course, the French pronunciation of my name, uh, Hebert, is Hebert. Uh And then there's, uh, you know, Darby, Darby Depot, uh, Center Darby. Uh, and I, River Darby is where the, where the farmers live. You know, the, some of the, the uh, soil in the Connecticut River is some of the best bottom, bottom land in the, in the world. Uh, a, a conservancy guy told me that. Uh, and of course, Center Derby. Uh, I'll mention that. Oh, and Upper Derby right here. Uh, so um, that, that's my Derby. This is uh, uh, when I worked at Dartmouth. I uh, I, I, uh, I was creative writing director for a while, and we used to have uh, uh, people come to you know give readings, uh, and we we announced them with these crummy. Uh, Microsoft Word uh, flyers, and I thought, well, I can do better than that. So I, uh, I bought Adobe Illustrator, and I started teaching myself how to use Adobe Illustrator. Uh, and uh, this is probably the best thing I ever did in Adobe Illustrator. It's, uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a drawing that, uh, that uh, uh, from my novel, The Passion of Estelle Jordan, uh, and that's my rendition of Estelle. Uh, number one, I'm, I, I don't have a favorite book there. Favorite book there. They're, they're kind of all my favorites. I, I just, the only book I, I never liked writing was Whisper My Name. Uh, I think that I probably should not have been writing a book uh, during that time period, but uh, I felt pressured to do so. That was your uh, second published novel, right? Third. Third. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't. I think I mentioned earlier. I don't. I don't find writing hard. I, I, I found it hard when I really shouldn't be doing it. So my rule now is that if it feels easy, I work. If it feels unpleasant, I stop. So, so my world, writing is either easy or impossible. But it's never really hard. 
this is a picture from uh, uh, Spoonwood, which is a, a, a fun book to, to write. It's about uh, uh, Fred, Frederick Elman, uh, who appears in the first book, Dogs of March. And uh, he, he's an alcoholic whose lover has died. And he takes his son, uh, an infant, and raises him in the woods uh, to stay away from booze. Uh, and he ends up making wooden spoons uh, to earn a few bucks. Uh, one of the inspirations for this was a guy named Dan Dustin, who's a spoon maker. Uh, uh, it, he can find his work at the Centipede Craft Sphere. He might be a very good person for you to interview. Uh, D U S T I N, Dan Dustin. And he, he, he lives in a, you know old school bus. Remember the old hippie school buses? Yeah. There's, there's one in my town of, of West Milan. Uh, you have to walk a mile up, straight up a hill, and there's an old school bus there where, where some people live. Um, this right here is just kind of a, kind of a general feeling of my sensibility uh, for, of New Hampshire. It's all about sticks. I, uh, I, I uh, have a collection of sticks. I just, t uh, just uh, notch them around the end and tie them up and hang them on the wall. So that's a stick on the wall, and that's my New Hampshire. Well, thank you for putting those on exhibit. Uh, and uh, I'm now going to kind of segue from the, the visual to how visual so many of your uh, pieces of writing are, whether it's you know from the Darby series or uh, uh, among the poems you just read. It's, it's not surprising that although there haven't been any films made based on uh, any of those books, I, I know that there has been uh, some attempts and some talk of that in the past, and who knows what, may, uh, what the future may hold as far as that goes. Can you talk about the, the uh, instances where there's been some conversation about making a film out of... Uh, well, I've like had a, a number of people have been interested in them, but uh, uh, most of them are documentary filmmakers who want to, who want to do a drama, who really didn't have much experience in uh, making dramas, um, and who ended up, a lot of them be, being my friends. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, I had one... Uh, I can't remember who it was now, an Asian who told me why, that the, uh, why the Hollywood people are not interested in my books. He said, you're too interior. Uh, and uh, of course, you can't. Um, I, I, I think my, my books can get, would make good movies without the interior, but you certainly can't uh, make a movie of what goes on in somebody's mind, except as a, a crude metaphor. Uh, but uh, I, I set out to be interior. One, one, of, one of my issues writing was uh, I really disliked uh, two books in particular, uh, The Great Gatsby uh, and uh, Disappear, uh, Deliverance. And both those books, uh, I thought, really uh, denigrated uh, uh, ordinary working people. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I, uh, my, part of my writing career has been a rebellion uh, against uh, uh, books like that and against the uh, general establishment of, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of the, lit the literary establishment where working people are either, you know, they're kind of, they're overly romanticized uh, or, they're, or they're just treated as, uh, as uh, such, uh, flat characters who do who do who do stupid things like uh, I think Deliverance is a perfect example of that, where uh, there's a scene where these uh, these backwoods people uh, want to have uh, uh, sex with a uh, uh, a guy, which makes it it, it it makes no sense at all, um, and so they, these people are treated more like devils than they are human beings. Uh, and I decided when I was going to write about working people or anybody, uh, I wanted to get into their interior world because I think everybody lives two lives. 
you live a life on the outside where you have to get along with other people, you have to get a job, you have to uh, feed yourself, you have to have shelter, you have to deal with your mortality, uh, all these things on the outside. Uh, and, you know, I think that movies in particular are really good at portraying that, but every person also has uh, an interior life, and that, that life is often more important to the person than uh, their exterior life. And, and when, those two, when those two lives come into conflict, uh, I mean, there you've, there you've got uh, grist for a novel. So that was my, uh, that, that was my, my path uh, to, to, to be a novelist, was that the in, interior, exterior uh, conflict. And speaking of uh, conflicts, uh, I know that there's a, of course, a significant one in your latest piece of writing, which you told me about before we uh, actually uh, went went live on cameras. Uh, are you willing to, to maybe give a little bit of a? Uh, I I don't think I want to prefer not to. I don't think I want to go there. All right. Right now, but there is a book I like to talk about. Though. Oh, please do. Uh, the Old American, uh, which is a historical novel. Uh, that I've that I've written in, and actually I've had I've had two books that sold pretty well. One is the Dogs of March, and the other one is the Old American. And the Old American is a story uh, based on uh, uh, Nathan Blake, and Nathan Blake was one of the founders of Keene. Uh, and uh, uh, in 1746, uh, he was captured by Indians and uh, brought to Canada. He spent three years with the Indians. Uh, and uh, I've been fascinated with that story, uh, and I, I, wrote a, I wrote a novel about it, but I didn't write it from Nathan's perspective. I wrote it from the point of view of the captor, uh, who was an older man. It is a, it's a fabulous line in the history of Keene, uh, which, which I just love. Uh, when Nathan Blake, who was a very athletic man, very athletic man, um, uh, when the Indians attacked, he he brought his family to the stockade where he knew they'd be safe, and then he left the stockade to let animals out of the bar his animals out of the barn, which he succeeded in doing. And he crept out a, a back way, and that up all of a sudden he's looking at a, at a uh, at India who's pointing a musket at him, uh, and uh, and and just trying to keep his cool. He said it's mighty early in the morning for this kind of stuff, and I've had nothing to eat. Never expected to be understood. Uh, the Indian said to him in perfect English, he said, it's a poor Englishman that cannot go to Canada without his breakfast. So I thought, this is a fabulous line by a savage. He's able to speak in a language not his own, able to make a joke in it, uh, and able to, to, to uh, have some news involved. And so uh, I, had writ I had already written uh, a complete draft of uh, The Old American from the perspective of Nathan Blake, who, who uh, uh, and then I, I, when I got done, I realized there was a problem with the book. And the problem was I didn't want to violate the, the historical Nathan Blake, who was, in a sense, too good to be true. I mean, he, he was a guy who n never broke. Uh, he prayed. Uh, uh, the first year as in, in his captivity, he was a, uh, the, his master, who was the guy who captured him, uh, discovered he was a athletic. Uh, and uh, put him in, in, in races. He was a racer. At the end of the second, at the end of the first year, his master died, and Nathan was elected to to uh, take his place. He married his master's wife, and uh, was became a sub chief in the tribe. At the end of the second year, uh, he wanted to go ho back home to to his English family. Uh, the Indians said, "Okay, but first you have to." build us a house like the English built. And so he helped these uh, na natives build a house, and then they let, they let him go. Uh, and and he, he was swapped for, uh, let him go to the French. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, but he never broke, he never changed. And my, my, I, uh, I, I, I really, I realized he was too good to be true. In fact, he, he oh, if I may go on. When he came back, uh, he took up his he, he took up his job you know his family uh, and then he uh, uh, when his wife died he was uh, 91 his wife died he remarried at age 94 
to a quote unquote interesting widow. And he finally died two months shy of his 100th birthday. So he was quite a guy, uh, but a little too good to be true for, for a novel. So I went back and rewrote the entire story from the perspective of the older, of, of the captor. Uh, and uh, th that was the challenge for me. And, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I, and I think it's, uh, artistically, it's a, a lot of people think it's my best book. I, I, I don't make those judgments, but I, I'm saying it's, uh, if you want to read a good historical novel, I, th I think you'd like that book. Well, Ernest Hebert, it has been uh, an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us today on uh, The Creators here on Some City in beautiful downtown Summersburg, New Hampshire. Uh, thanks so much for, for being here and talking with us. Well, thank you. It was a, a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed talking to Tom. It's good to see you again. Yeah, I think it's been something like 36 years since we've been in the same room.